Uh, my name is Dune Lankard. I'm an EAC Athabascan native from the Copper River Delta in Prince William Sound, Alaska. Uh, our people, the EACs, originally came out of the interior of Alaska and crossed uh, the glaciers uh, 3,500 years ago, ending up in the Gulf of Alaska. And the EACs, probably in the history of time, we've probably never numbered over a thousand. And we, uh, upon receipt, uh, coming down to the Gulf of Alaska, uh, we ended up in this uh, place called Yakutat, which is an EAC word that means lagoon behind the sea, where's the, where the canoes rest. And <clears throat> from there, we migrated 300 miles across the Copper River Delta to a place that's now called Cordova, which was originally called EAC. And uh, there we had numerous village sites, subsistence sites. Uh, then uh, we had the interactions with the Spaniards in the 1700s, the Russians in the 1800s, and then the Americans by um, 1867. <clears throat> when supposedly the state was sold by Russia to America. And the EACs probably over the next 150 years had to endure uh, all of the uh, issues with, uh, you know, uh, dealing with Americans from smallpox, influenza, uh, tuberculosis, alcoholism, uh, drug abuse from the uh, various canneries that would only hire uh, Chinese laborers who brought in opium and the Americans brought in the alcohol. And, and so we went through some pretty dark times. And, uh, <clears throat> and if you wanted to go to the second slide, there's our Native Conservancy. Uh, you can see in, <clears throat> good job everyone. Uh, you can see in the, the bottom part where the arrow is, uh, that's where our EAC ancestral lands are. And my people, the EAC, are one of the 57 Athabascan tribes in the state. And pretty much uh, everything that's kind of brown and uh, kind of reddish and tannish looking, all of that is, is Athabascan country. And with the Inupiats up to the north and the Yupiks to the west and down towards the Aleutian chain is the Aleuts and then the Clinkets to the southeast and Haida and to Shimstian on down towards America. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to share is that the, uh, when Dr. Michael Krauss did the EAC uh, English Dictionary in the early 70s with my grandmother, Ataki, uh, he'd written a 4,500 page EAC English Dictionary that uh, when they tied it with other Athabascan languages and, <clears throat> and studied the uh, similarities and the differences, they found that the EAC language was more closely related to the Navajos and Apaches than it was to the uh, tribes of the interior. And Dr. Krause said that we were isolated for so long, for 3,500 years, that uh, that was probably why our language was distinct and different than the other tribes where when you have a lot of melting pot tribes in the even the Athabascan culture, then you have a lot of slang. And he said, you didn't find that in EAC. And so he said, we were more closely related to the Navajos and Apaches in the Southwest, which was really interesting. Uh, you know, when I think about Alaska's body, body of law, next slide, please. When I think about uh, Alaska's body of law and everything from statehood in 59 to um, the uh, limited entry law of 1973 uh, that took our fin fish and commoditized them, um, turned it into um, a commercial entity <clears throat> and our salmon were taken from us to uh, ANILCA, Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act of 1980, to the net operating loss sales of 1986. Uh, the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, excuse me, was in 1971. There was a number of laws and things that uh, 
uh, were enacted by the American government that drastically impacted Native peoples. And so also uh, around the time of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, uh, right before that, uh, the oil industry and government founded oil in Prudhoe Bay. So if you look at that little map in, in the corner there on the very top of the state of Alaska is where Prudhoe Bay is. And when they found uh, oil, <clears throat> they realized that they had an Indian problem. So unlike in America where they had 226 or so uh, native tribes that all had Indian country status and, and tribal status and sovereignty in Indian country basically in Alaska, they forced us into native corporations. And so <clears throat> no longer did our uh, uh, women circles and grandmother circles control um, our land, uh, but uh, they were run by proxies and solicitations and Robert's rules of order. Uh, and we all received hundred shares of surface shares, anything above the ground and then 100 shares of subsurface rights that was controlled by regional corporations, just to give you an idea, and no Indian country status, no sovereignty in Alaska. And this map right here shows where the Exxon Valdez oil spill pretty much impacted 1500 miles of coastline uh, in Alaska. And it impacted about a dozen different villages, uh, if you look at, um, and I um, apologize for not being able to see all the, the different words, <clears throat> but in the uh, kind of the upper uh, right hand corner where the cross hatching start, that's where um, this bill happened and it went to the west uh, and was moving at a rate of about 70 miles a day. And that was the day to me that the ocean died and something inside of me came to life. And I decided to become a social uh, activist from that point on and save as much habitat as I could. Next slide, please. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, starting out, uh, I wanted to uh, figure out uh, how to save as much habitat as I could because the native corporations at the time had decided that they were gonna clear cut a million acres in the parallel path of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And I realized that I had to save everything I possibly could if we were gonna have uh, native subsistence, if we were gonna have commercial fishing, if we were gonna have any way of life on the ocean that made any sense. And at that point in my life, I realized that I had to be warrior dune that I had to, uh, instead of uh, bows and arrows and spears and guns or whatever, I had to use paper arrows to figure out how I was gonna save our land. And so uh, fortunately, we were able to get a, a $900 million settlement out of Exxon for restoration in the spill zone. We used about 400 million to save 765,000 acres of habitat and we ended up um, you know, saving pretty much uh, the whole million because they weren't able to get to a lot of those areas uh, because they were protected and continued to be roadless. And so in 2003, we started the Native Conservancy to, you know, basically figure out how to save the Copper River Delta, uh, address uh, protecting our traditional foods and subsistence way of life and revitalizing Native culture and changing our relationship with our food source by growing it, catching it, processing it, uh, direct marketing ourselves rather than relying on uh, corporations or canneries or processors to do this. And so our vision is to build community resiliency through regenerative economies. Next slide, please. And <clears throat> when I think about the challenges of food insecurity and climate change right now, just to give you an idea, Three years ago, only 44,000 sockeyes came home. Uh, in 2019, uh, the ocean temp in Prince William Sound heated up to 76 degrees for three weeks, uh, where millions of mussels and krill and wild kelp forests and salmon uh, um, and 
you know, birds died everywhere because the water was too hot. There was no oxygen. Then by 2020, and this is on the Cop River Delta, one of the last world-class thriving ecosystems left on planet earth. And so by 2020, only uh, this year, only 85,000 sockeyes came home. And so when you think about these changes that are happening in the ocean and to the land, uh, at the rates that they are. I mean, last year, two and a half million acres of, of Alaska burned. And usually we have more rain in monsoons and cooler weather with uh, the permafrost, sea ice and glaciers melting at unprecedented rates. We're having the biggest uh, frontline climate change impacts daily in Alaska than any other state in America. Next slide. So we're gonna to have to figure out how we're going to deal with uh, uh, our food. And so I decided that uh, after 30 years of being Warrior Dune, that it's time to focus on regenerative solutions. What are we gonna to do to help the land and help the ocean and figure out how to feed our people? So this little chart kind of gives you an idea. We wanna build portable and affordable community coal storage. It's kelp seed, uh, hatcheries or nurseries, uh, continue to do restoration for the oceans, uh, create different native programs like food sovereignty, food security, and, in, and indigenous uh, enterprises. So, you know, what our hope and goals are is to, you know, be able to uh, work with indigenous peoples anywhere on the planet that want to change their relationship with their food source. Next slide, please. And uh, so here in, in uh, uh, the Exxon spill zone, the 1500 miles, what we'd like to see is 50,000 acres of uh, the ocean carpeted with kelp in the Exxon spill zone. And that would help with the lingering oil, uh, with uh, ocean acidification, with the blob, meaning the hotter ocean climates, ocean rise, uh, a lot of the surge that's happening because of ocean rise is wiping out uh, villages across Alaska. 31 villages need to be relocated and go to higher ground. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we have to, uh, you know, figure out how we're going to help these villages empower themselves to not only move to higher ground, but feed their people and create green jobs for building resiliency for the future. And indigenous peoples have thousands and thousands of years of history, uh, uh, you know, harvesting wild kelp, uh, harvesting herring rowan kelp, uh, other tribes put, you know, spruce uh, branches into the water and have the uh, herring spawn on that. Uh, but it's, it's different things that, uh, you know, have we've shared and harvested for thousands of years in our oceans. And so that's what we need to do now is to really focus and address food security and food sovereignty issues of resiliency for our communities. So right now with having kelp uh, farms, both food kelp farms as well as restorative kelp farms in the ocean, we'll be able to restore the habitat for the wild herring that have gone from to 1,000 ton uh, returning annually down to less than 4,000 ton. Uh, it would also create habitat for wild salmon versus hatchery salmon. So it would give the wild salmon a little sporting chance of survival because when they go out into the ocean for two to seven years, depending on their species and do their world tour, uh, they still compete for the same food sources. Uh, and so what's happening is that the more hatchery fish that are pumped into the ocean, they're competing for the same food sources. So what's happening is less fish are coming home, no fish are coming home and smaller fish are coming home. So this year, our average six pound sockeye salmon came back at four and a half pounds. So everything that we do for restoring habitat in the ocean can only help the hundreds of critters that make a living. Uh, next slide, please. And so, we have to also increase increase our value added uh, processing, uh, you know, in whatever food source it is that we uh, grow or harvest or or uh, want to feed our people. So we can keep the the jobs and 
and uh, the money closer to ourselves and our villages and our homes and our people if we're doing the value adding and direct marketing ourselves. So what this slide shows is why farm kelp now, uh, because it's about economic diversification, it's about sustainability, it's about you know developing a mariculture plan that works for the villages. Because if you look at the villages in Prince William Sound, after the Exxon spill, a lot of the youth uh, left the villages in search of better jobs and a way to make a living. And so if we could you know, create green jobs, cleaning up the ocean, uh, restoring, uh, mitigating the damages from the spill, uh, creating a food source as well as green jobs to uh, restore the environment, then I think that we're gonna be able to attract our youth back home. And next slide, please. So I, I, I really uh, am hopeful that uh, things are gonna change. So the various stages of development that we're at right now, <clears throat> right now we're in the uh, pilot one, the stage one, which is <clears throat> getting farm sited and permitted, uh, getting test lines in the ocean to figure out what's gonna grow where, so we can analyze the growth rate and the potential. Uh, figuring out how we can have mobile uh, community cold storage processing as well as seed nurseries uh, in different remote areas. So uh, the villages can decide, you know, what types of kelp they would like to grow or what different species of mariculture, which is bivalves, <clears throat> you know, clams, mussels, uh, scallops, whatever. Uh, you know, there's about seven to 10 different resources that they can grow locally to feed themselves. And then our second stage in the initial seeding is certainly getting the farms in the water uh, for our seven 22 acre farms, uh, which each one can have the potential of growing upwards of 300,000 pounds a year. We've got <clears throat> additional farms uh, sited or, or at least considering for 2021 and 2022. Uh, next year, our goal is to get 10 to 20,000 pounds of raw product to various markets uh, to test uh, these different value added products. And just to give you an idea, uh, you know, there's a number of different uh, products that you can make from uh, food, uh, soap, shampoos, biofuels, cosmetics, supplements, uh, animal feed, compost, fertilizer, um, you know, mulch, I mean, the list goes on. And then in stage three, we want to expand to uh, different regions in Alaska, uh, working with different tribes who want to get in. And we're also looking at, you know, trying to figure out how we can get long-term low interest rates uh, for getting more farmers in the water. But partnering with the villages in the spill zone is the first step to figure out how to uh, get the tribes to be able to finance these operations. Next slide. So uh, in everything to do with food and, and trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, get people to uh, feed themselves. I remember uh, when I met Elizabeth Hoover, she told me about this article, uh, this food sovereignty expert, uh, who's absolutely wonderful. She said she had written this article, how can you call yourself sovereign if you can't feed yourself. And I was like, oh my God, you know, that's that's absolutely right. We need to be able to figure out how to feed ourselves. And so in my industry as a fisherman, and I've been fishing since I was five and I'm 61 now, I've been controlled and owned by the processors. They monopolize the industry. They set all the uh, prices. They uh, basically restrict the profits of small scale farmers because we have to sell everything to them for practically nothing. And there's at least two processors in five in Cordova that are billion dollar a year companies. Yeah, you know, we got buildings falling down and new paint jobs that need to happen on the rest of the buildings. But how we change these things is by doing what we're talking about, figuring out how to reduce the barrier to entry and the costs from everything from, you know, uh, doing our permitting to figuring out where we're going to get our seed, uh, growing the seed, cultivating it, uh, you know, the financing of the buying all the equipment to training the various farmers. Uh, we want to train our own trainers. We want to go as far as uh, doing our own harvesting, our own processing, our own direct marketing. 
because it's really about food security planning. It's, you know, figuring out what can grow where because of climate change. And then once you figure out that sweet spot, you got to figure out how you can store it properly, how you can process it, and then how you can market it yourself. Otherwise, you will be controlled by the man. All right, next slide. And here's my sister Pamela holding a, a nice big 40 pound king, looks even bigger than that. Uh, Pamela is the queen of kings. She's one of the best smokers on the planet and one of my best friends uh, and also my spiritual guru. So she's got a lot of roles. And we are trying to, um, you know, em empower uh, small scale artisanal cottage industry fishers and farmers uh, and help them prosper, you know, how to figure out uh, how to do small scale uh, portable and affordable processing, as I mentioned, uh, providing economic tools and opportunities uh, so homes can make healthy food choices feeding their people. Because I know for the EAC people, we've had thousands of years of being healthy and strong and amazing. And with this American Western culture, uh, foods are you know, uh, more accessible that aren't quite as good for us and, and keep us healthy and strong. And <clears throat> whenever I go rafting on the Copper River, which we've done over 80 trips and a thousand people have joined us, we eat the wild salmon from the river. And when you go through that process and that ritual and that ceremony of harvesting that salmon out of the water, bringing it to shore, cleaning it, processing it, steaking, uh, filleting it, and then cooking it for dinner that night for your small tribe of a dozen to 15 people, depending on how many are with you. What happens is they change. You can see how they then understand what subsistence is all about. They understand what it's like to live from the land and the sea. It, they understand what we have to do is, is uh, co-management and figuring out how to be better stewards of the land. So these salmon keep coming by. And just to give you an idea, uh, the salmon that we harvest, you know, have to get by gill netters and saners and trollers and trawlers, <clears throat> uh, sport fishermen. Then when they get, they get into the river unit, they have to get by the bears and the eagles and the seals and the wolves. Uh, and then me, you know, dipping them out of the water so we can have them in our, our camps and, and rafting camps. And then when they get up river, they have to get by the fish wheels, the dip netters and more sports fishermen in their spawning beds. So every salmon is special. Every salmon has to be resilient. Next slide. <clears throat> this is our new kelp boat, the Noctiluca. And Noctiluca stands for uh, the glowing phosphorus in the ocean. I grew up uh, looking into the ocean and it was like my looking into outer space because I could literally go down miles looking at this Noctiluca in the water and seeing the various porpoises and salmon swimming through it. But this vessel has a huge crane that we can lift our anchors and launch our, our kelp farm arrays and, and be able to haul 36,000 pounds of kelp aboard in small totes, in half ton totes, uh, to be able to get our product to market. Uh, once these, uh, you know, seven family kelp farms are up in operation and fully uh, you know, uh, producing the number of products uh, coming out of each farm annually, uh, we'll be able to produce 2 million pounds of uh, kelp products annually, which is pretty amazing. So we need big vessels like this in order to pull this off. Next slide. This is shows just three of the different species of kelp uh, that we're focusing on right now. The bull kelp top left, the ribbon kelp, top right and then the sugar kelp, the bottom left. And they're all beautiful. They're all amazing and, and golden and brown. And uh, when you pull them out of the water and you dip them in hot blanching water, they turn this chartreuse green and they're just yummy as can be. And uh, so it's, it's really exciting. And you can see how much habitat they create in the ocean. And this is why 300 species make a living here because it's a wonderful way to, to grow up in the ocean. Next slide. Uh, here again is just some of the potential markets for kelp, food and agriculture uh, that I'd mentioned earlier. 
And, you know, if we can get uh, 2% kelp in animal feed and feed it to cows, we can uh, reduce methane output by 60% from each one of those cows. And if you look at cows alone on the planet, they emit 60% of the methane that's being uh, spewed into our atmosphere daily. Next slide. Okay, here's the kelp uh, growing process to date. Uh, this is some of the equipment that we've secured, our boat and uh, portable uh, community kelp seed nursery, uh, dive gear, uh, test line equipment to get our seven sites in the water, uh, different seed support from the Denali Commission and other uh, social impact investors who are helping us. Uh, getting these seven test lines is gonna happen over the next uh, uh, eight to 12 weeks, uh, depending on how fast these little spores uh, pollinate and are ready to go to sea again. And then we'll go and do this outplanting and then uh, uh, we can watch kelp grow, hopefully get paid for it. Uh, the next is uh, just, you know, getting our, our, our step after that is to get our 722 acre farms in the water uh, next fall. Next slide. Uh, this is just some of the support that is needed and, and every native person has to be bold and courageous to ask for support. And so uh, we're no different, you know, the Native Conservancy, you know, we need additional dive gear, we need anchors, buoys, lines uh, for kelp test line deployment, we need small skiffs and motors, trailers for hauling anchors and kelp. Uh, we're looking for matching funds for getting more seed nurseries out into remote areas to help the different tribes, uh, funding for collecting and transporting uh, wild seed to the nursery and, and you know, eventually to market. Uh, test lines, you know, you've got to, you know, figure out how to be able to test the salinity in the pH is really important to uh, informing the siting of various kelp farms. And then uh, we're also looking into getting some smart buoys. I call them magic buoys uh, that'll help collect data so we know what's going on to help with uh, do our part with climate change. And it's just exciting as all heck. Next slide, please. Uh, this, I decided to throw this in here just to give you an idea of the Gulf of Alaska coastline. You can see Cordova uh, to the left side, uh, where the in between Copper River Delta and Prince William Sound. Uh, these are development threats that are happening continuously. Uh, over the last three decades, we've taken on 35 uh, major environmental battles and won 33 of them. We filed at least 50 lawsuits and won 45 of those. We just recently saved that controller bay number three at, at Catella. We just saved 62,000 acres there, but there's more threats as you can see from mining the Bering coal field to building a deep water port at Shepherd Point, the military, the Air Force and the uh, Navy bombing in the offshores in the Gulf of Alaska to BLM lands now that the glaciers are receding. Uh, you know, there's plans to mine uh, 92,000 acres where the Bering Glacier is receding. And then the Alaska Mental Health Trust uh, wants to mine 40, uh, 30 to 45 miles of coastal beach line for different minerals. And what they're doing is mental. Next slide. <clears throat> this is a... Uh, part of the Bering River coal field, which is uh, 11,000 acres uh, of coal uh, in uh, vertical seams, uh, that uh, the only way to remove this uh, coal is to do mountaintop removal, which would just devastate this part of Alaska, which is considered, or at least is still 98% uh, roadless and wild. And our goal is if we can save this the last 11,000 acres, uh, we'll be able to essentially stop all roads and development and essentially save uh, um, 3 million acres of lower copper river watershed for all time. So we're going to continue to save habitat uh, and do our, our food sovereignty and food uh, security program at the same time. Next slide. Uh, EAC land back into EAC hands. I love this. 
Uh, one of the programs that our Native Conservancy has is that we want to um, do a, a cultural GIS mapping project with SAI uh, in order to take all of our place names from our EAC English Dictionary and actually do GIS mapping of the Copper River Delta in areas of Eastern Prince William Sound to show that not only are those places uh, you know, still there, but the EAC people are still here. And we don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. So we started a, a land back program with our partner, NDN Collective, uh, who recently uh, gifted us uh, some money to buy back this coal field and we're in negotiations right now. We've got the Land and Water Conservation Fund interested, the Exxon Valdez Wilson Trustee Council, the US Forest Service, the National Fisheries and Wildlife Foundation, and a number of private partners that are helping us figure out how to get our EAC land back. Next slide. <clears throat> Here's a, a list of some of our partners, and, and we'd love to add all your names to it. Uh, these are some amazing uh, native-led organizations, as well as our partner Green Wave, Honor the Earth, Indian Collective, the Baum Foundation, April uh, Minich Buxbaum and her partners at, at the Baum Foundation, Seventh Generation Fund, the Chorus Foundation for the Wild, the Alaska Conservation Foundation we're working with to create a structured fund, meaning that we're bringing funds together from uh, indigenous peoples and corporations, uh, social impact investors, and hopefully the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. And the Denali Commission is very interested in what we're doing, as well as uh, Temple Elias Trust. Next slide. So, uh, Awata, uh, thank you for listening. And, and uh, I know I had to run through that fairly quickly with all the slides. Uh, but I would be happy to take any questions that anybody has and here's our contact information and do check out our website and, and uh, write us and, and tell us what, what you think. Okay, let's see. This, this one right here. Okay, let me see uh, if there's any questions. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, it's hard for me to read and how, how are we doing on time? Um, seven, more minutes. seven more minutes. Okay, so um, go ahead. I'll read you the question, Dune. Is that okay? Okay, that, that would be great. Okay, so the question is, what kind of communication or partnership? Okay, I, I can't, I can't hear you at all. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, there's a question. What kind of communications or partnerships do you have with other indigenous fisher folk outside of Alaska? Um, you know, when I used to uh, pioneer fisheries, I was working in Canada with the Métis Federation. Uh, I was working in the Great Lakes uh, area uh, with a number of uh, indigenous tribes. Uh, the Amamutsin in California. Uh, we're getting phone calls, uh, you know, from uh, different tribal people in different parts of the state of Alaska, California, Oregon, Washington, New York, uh, Canada, uh, New Zealand. Uh, I've talked to some tribal folks over there. So, you know, we're, we're having a lot of interest in what we're doing. But one of the things that we realized is that the best way that we can help people is if we just lead through example. And so that's why we're, we're building uh, these uh, various uh, community coal storages and portable seed nurseries in different ways that we can help empower indigenous peoples just by showing them what is possible. And uh, then I also, uh, you know, I'm the 
uh, president, I drew this uh, short straw of this organization that we started called the Native Land Trust Coalition. And uh, it makes up uh, about a dozen different tribes right now. There's about 25 different tribes that are interested in, in land conservation. And I felt that it, was, it could serve as two purposes. One, to figure out how we can get cultural easements in place and also uh, how we can change the public interest valuation to include intrinsic values like wild salmon, clean air, uh, you know, uh, uh, tribes, uh, you know, trying to figure out how we can change that public interest valuation process that's so skewed. And then also uh, with that, you know, try and figure out how we can work with uh, tribes on, on getting uh, programs like this. Like if you're interested in in uh, getting a kelp farm in the water, you know, we'll be able to assist you and show you what we've done up here, what works, what doesn't work. And we're networking with various uh, 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 groups uh, that, uh, you know, are also uh, showing an interest in this new type of regenerative farming for the ocean. But what's important to know is that uh, this is a land claims that is going on in the oceans right now. So indigenous peoples and tribal peoples everywhere across the planet are gonna have to step up. And so we're gonna work, uh, I'm working with Sky uh, on trying to come up with a declaration of principles and in indigenous uh, kelp farmers rights. Uh, so we can figure out how we can protect uh, the lands and oceans near our village sites that we've uh, uh, endured and, and thrived on for thousands of generations, and that shouldn't change. So uh, our goal is to help indigenous peoples uh, get empowered and get educated and get out there and start growing some kelp. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah, we got a few more, Dune. Um, Next, we got, what can folks do to support the policy changes you are advocating for? I think, uh, you know, communicating with you and me uh, will really help a lot because, uh, you know, we'll be able to uh, show you what we're thinking in different um, uh, legislation and, and policies that are going to take place. And every state has different laws and different jurisdictions and different ocean policies and management. And so what our goal is, is to uh, figure out how to help indigenous peoples uh, understand this permitting process and, and how to do landscape analysis and, 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 and really get a handle on what is possible in their, in their oceans. So contact us, get a hold of us. Yeah, perfect answer. Um, there's another question here. Have you noticed much of a difference in policy depending on which party is in control of the White House? No, uh, we found that most of our support uh, is actually coming from uh, Republicans over time, both in land conservation and in what's happening in the ocean. And so I'm hoping that with this regime change uh, coming up here soon, uh, that we'll gain that same kind of support uh, from the Dems. And, and I really feel that it's about ocean solutions, uh, being regenerative, being restorative and uh, building uh, resiliency for the future. Great. So the next question is, so often the food movement discussion is void of fisher folk. What can we do to be more inclusive of such an important population? Hmm. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's like, um, you know, I, I guess the, the people in the ocean, you know, we, we have, inalienable rights, even though it, it doesn't seem that way, but we're the stakeholders of the sea. And so I think if we found a way uh, to be able to not only communicate, but to, to direct energy, and energy to me is time, money, or love, whatever direction that we need to direct it in order to create that change that we wanna see. So I really think it's about organizing 
and, and networking and trying to figure out how we're going to direct this energy to change the things that we need, we can do it. Thank you, Dune. We just have one last question, um, which I love this question. It seems like you have so much development and policy to fight. How do you, how do you find time for fishing? <laughs> well, um, I ended up selling my gilded permit this year so I could focus on uh, kelp farming and figuring out how to restore the ocean. And I've spent 60 years of my life uh, making a really good living on the ocean. And I just felt that it's my time to give back to the ocean because it needs restoration and it's in dire need of, of mitigation and recovery. So I do get to spend uh, a lot of time on the water again. Uh, and uh, it's always gonna be in my blood and, and uh, one day soon I'll be able to share, uh, you know, growing kelp with my 10 year old daughter. And so I'll be able to spend more time at sea. But I really appreciate everybody's questions and uh, listening to this and, and do reach out to us. We'd be happy to connect even more. So thank you.